Hi, I'm Jill Roberts, and this is Psychic Today. What does it mean to be a multidimensional being? And how do we expand our awareness to harness the fullness of who we are? In this season, we embark on a journey of self-discovery and transformation through the 22 archetypes of our multidimensional self. So a big part of this journey is about helping us to recognize our our multidimensionality, to recognize how these 22 archetypes play in our own life, but also how they play in the life of our higher self that has these 22 different parallel lives. What do we mean by parallel lives? Well, the idea goes back to our true self is being something that is beyond this hologram of this physical universe. So if we were to think of our one true self as being beyond the hologram, beyond the quantum sea, in a place metaphysically that we call the great central sun, from that place of our true self, there are 22 archetypal rays or aspects of that true self that are sent out through the universe and they go to different planets. So each one becomes like a being on a different planet. And then from those different places where our true self emanates out to it then reflects back those rays and those energies to all the 22 planets again so we have one of those planets here on earth but we can also be out in Sirius system we could be out in the Pleiades you know we could be having various aspects of ourselves in 22 different planets And from those places, those 22 archetypes get reflected back here to Earth. And our higher self that has its emanations here on Earth then has 22 archetypes also being emanated down to Earth and incarnating. So when we say parallel lives, it's like we have 22 different aspects of our higher selves living out these lives here on Earth in in parallel with each other, but... They're either on slightly different frequencies or just different people who are having a life under a different archetypal influence. It's kind of similar to why we don't hear all the radio stations being broadcast all at once because we're only tuned in to one frequency station. And as we become more aware of these archetypes and how they play out in our lives, we can then start to consciously connect with our higher self And then that will also help us consciously connect with those parallel lives. And the whole goal is to ultimately bring those 22 into one, to bring them all into coherence so that we can live as our here, ourselves fully embodied and manifested into physical life. So that is a matter of becoming aware, becoming more expanded in our consciousness of who we are. And then as we merge those 22 down to one and we live as our higher selves, then our higher selves step onto the next journey, not only of mastering this life here on earth, but becoming a galactic being and connecting with its other 22 emanations on other planets. If we had this kind of multidimensional awareness of all these parallel lives, our entire worldview would shift from how it is today. For one thing, judgment would fade away. We'd no longer judge our mistakes because we'd realize that all of them brought us different learning opportunities. We'll also no longer feel competitive or jealous about the success of others because in one of our parallel lives and realities, we are the champion and the best of our class. So many of the frailties of our human ego would vanish because of this expanded awareness of our total self. Now, why 22? Well, it's based on the structure of the tree of life. There are 10 spheroid on the tree of life and 22 paths that connect those together. The spheres represent objective states of being, where the pathways represent the subjective experience of traveling between them. And they're often referred to as states of becoming. These 22 pathways basically define the key lessons and transformations that we're meant to go through in life. Each path invokes an energy that brings movement and key lessons and transformations that we're meant to go through in life. So it shifts us from one state of being to another. 
In essence, they catalyze spiritual and personal alchemy. Is there anything that can help us better understand what these archetypes are? Fortunately, yes. While there are many layers to these archetypes, one tool that we can use to make them more relatable to our physical lives is the major arcana of the tarot. Now, the term arcana comes from the Latin arcanum, which basically means a mystery or secret of before we go much further. Let me first say and clarify that tarot does not come from Kabbalah, but it can be related because the tree of life is a universal template for organizing information about our lives and universe as a whole. And as the major arcana do relate to the 22 work of types of our physical life experiences, they can be mapped onto the tree of life and its 22 paths. These correlations of the archetypes to the path were first made by French initiate uh, Leif Levy over a hundred years ago, and then was followed by other initiates of Western mystery school tradition, although there's still some debates about the exact order and mapping. So for our purposes in this journey, we will follow the sequence of the universal Rider Waite Smith tarot deck. The deck was first designed in 1909 by Arthur Edward Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith to initiate so the original Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And the reason that we use this deck is that the way that Waite was a scholar of alchemy, Kabbalah, medics, and other initiatory teachings, and he drew from his vast knowledge, training, insights into mystical wisdom. And then he teamed up with Pamela Smith to incorporate this into her intuitive artistry. And the results of the collaboration produced one of the most universal, accurate, and pure decks of archetypal and alchemical symbolism. Where does the tarot come from? The tarot that we know today mostly traces its history back to the Renaissance, Italy, and France. So Italy and France, during the Renaissance, the artists deliberately infused their medical chemical wisdom into their art. But the wisdom they drew from had its roots in ancient Egypt mystery schools, or Tho, a god of wisdom. And thousands of years earlier, the major arcana, or the 22 keys of the tarot, is a picture book of wisdom that depicts the journey of mystical ascension and transformation. And that's what's important here because this is what we're all trying to achieve. Of course, telling a story through images was not new in the Renaissance. After all, this is the hieroglyphs on on the temple walls of ancient Egypt. And uh, they were all the sewer of the, of what, the Renaissance was all about, the artists were basically doing the reinterpreting of the Egyptian hieroglyphs into European style imagery. According to oral teaching that I've researched in modern mystery schools, the 22 archetypal, uh, the archetypes rather depicted in the major arcana are actually originally brought to earth by the family of Tho or a race of evolved intergalactic and interdimensional of Ra. Um, not Tho, sorry, of Ra. And there are books on Ra if you're interested. So they were originally brought to Earth by Ra, which is um, a race of evolved intergalactic and interdimensional beings. And they visited this planet many times to support, to support our progression here on Earth. The original 22 archetypes were essentially anchored in forms of what we call the gods and goddesses of the ancient Egyptian pantheon. They embodied the original multidimensional patterns of universal energies, meaning these archetypes were not just about humans, they were universal. But by the beginning of the 1900s, the various tarot decks throughout Europe had become more artistic than accurate. So when Waite and Smith set out to make a new deck, they wanted it to be both artistic and accurate. They wanted to restore to the universal archetypes but in a way that we can more easily relate to today. 
as we explore tarot in this journey, it's not for purpose of divination, but rather we're using them as windows into the self. At the same time, we can, of course, use these tools to ask questions, and they can help us see past our blind spots, our emotional attachments, and our mental illusions. They show us a map of our own mind and soul. Each card is full of meaning and layers of symbolism that help us to connect to the archetypes and the symbols and the images. They act like bridges and links that help lead us back to the source within the archetypal realm. Symbols are the language of the unconscious. They provide a tool for our conscious mind to communicate with the unconscious and with the universal mind. Each major arcana key helps to bridge the gap between this hologram that we live in and the spiritual worlds that are beyond the hologram. How do we use tarot in this journey of self-discovery? Well, through this process, we'll be working with just one or two major arcana cards at a time. The major arcana have a sequence to them, and they are numbered between 0 and 21. This book of wisdom can actually be read in either direction to reveal different secrets. For example, when starting with key 21, the world, and reading them in reverse sequence up until key 0, the fool. They are said to be the creation story of the world up to our present state. But when we follow the forward direction from key 0 to 21, they describe a different story. They lead us on a journey of mystical ascension back to spiritual wisdom and oneness. And we work with, excuse me, <coughs> we work with each one in a forward sequence. They lead us through what is called the hero's journey. <coughs> excuse me. The journey of self-actualization. Let's just re recap for a second because I had a little bit of a coughing um, fit. So the major arcana lead us on a journey of mystical ascension back to spiritual wisdom and oneness. And as we work with each one in the forward sequence, they lead us through what's called the hero's journey, the journey of self-actualization. Now, returning to Kabbalah for a moment, recall what we said that the 22 major um, arcana content can be mapped out onto the 22 paths of the Tree of Life. Each of these paths is really more about the 22 Hebrew letters, which are said to be an ancient language of light and creation. Now, in addition to these letters being associated with the Tree of Life, or in the Book of Formation, they're also described as being arranged on a sphere. And in this circular format, when every letter is then connected to every other letter, it forms a beautiful mandala known as the 231 gates. When we match the, two, the tarot keys with the Hebrew letters around the sphere, we can see it becomes like a wheel. And when this arrangement, the key zero or the fool is placed at the top of the wheel, with left keys 1 through 10, then descended down on the left side. Between key 10, the wheel, and key 11, justice, is what we call a turning point at the bottom. And then keys 12 through 21 ascend up on the right side. As this wheel spins, it goes through one complete cycle of alchemical process. Now in alchemy, the number 7 is also really important. There are seven stages in the transformational process, which is something that we explored previously. In ancient Egypt, Egyptian mythology, we're also, there was also seven stages of the soul's journey through the afterlife. And in hermetic philosophy, there are seven hermetic principles. So the number seven shows up in many significant ways. We can also divide the tarot keys into groups of seven. When we do this, the fool, or key zero, was put into its own category because this represents us embarking on the spiritual journey. Then keys one through seven, the magician through the chariot, relate to the stages of preparation for the great work. These form the early lessons of the journey that teach us about the archetypal principles as powers within our own consciousness. 
Then keys 8 through 14, strength through temperance, connect to the experience of life that take us through the first four stages of alchemy, which are calcination, dissolution, separation, and conjunction. And finally, keys 15 through 21, which are the devil through the world card. These cards represent the final three stages of alchemy that refine our soul and bring us more important and <clears throat> more spiritual attainment. And those are chemical stages relating to fermentation, distillation, and coagulation. We'll explore each of these as we go through the journey of this season on Psychic Today. As we embark on the hero's journey, we of course begin as the fool. That's because the journey offers often begins as an innocent quest for adventure and achievement of ideals. When a search for universal wisdom and starting with the beginner's mind, we all begin as a neophyte, someone who lacks experience on the path of higher wisdom. <clears throat> Before this takes a leap of faith and walks that path with complete trust. Now the fool's number is zero. The beginner's mind is an empty mind. It's full of nothing, meaning nothing limits our thinking or the possibilities we think are available to us. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now zero means nothing in Kabbalah. It's the gate of stillness or emptiness that connects us to, to the gap, the quantum zero point field. From here, pure spirit emerges. Our original self passes through the gate of zero. <coughs> Excuse me. I had to take a drink of something for a second. If we turn to the imagery of the tarot, or the fool, we'll see youthful and androgynous figure who is out smelling the roses and taking in glorious breath of fresh air, looking out upon a great expanse of land and sky perched at the edge of a cliff. The fool gaze, <clears throat> the fool's gaze is sim somewhere off in the distant heights above and beyond his current position. He also has magical gifts with him. These include a hat with a feather in it, a white rose, a staff, and a satchel. And he also has his trusty loyal friend with him in the form of a white puppy. And that kind of mimics the fool's gesture. If you look at the position of his dog, it represents something that was wild from nature, but has now become tamed and trained to be a loyal friend or companion and helper of a man. <clears throat> now this card depicts all four kingdoms of the mineral kingdom, which is the ground, the vegetable kingdom, which we can see in the flower and the reef, the animal kingdom, which is represented here by the dog, as well as the feather in his hat, and the human kingdom, which is the fool himself. And the feather also represents the elements of air, as well as the father of the Egyptian goddess Murat, which stands for truth and purity. And the primal color of this card is bright pale yellow, which is the color of the morning sunshine. It is also associated with the element of air. Also in the card, we see a white sun above the snow-capped mountain peaks in the background. The wide sun radiates pure light and energy of source. Let's look at the fool's clothing, because the clothing always represents something in these cards. Now with the fool, he has a white undergarment on, which is the inner ray that represents the light of wisdom. But covering over the top of this is the black outer coat, lined with red, and it also has symbols on it. Now the black represents ignorance, the red represents passion and fire, and the decorations of uh, the green leads and yellow circles look like either fruit or spirit wheels upon it. Now his purse or his satchel at the end of the staff represents stored memory of his spirit and where he came from and prior to the invention, uh, adventure he's about to embark on. This is something that when we're all starting our spiritual journey, it is the starting place of where we're at. And as we become more and more attuned and resonant with 
the universe, we will follow down these 22 archetypes. So, um, when I come back, let's discover, let's discover what this card is really trying to show us and teach us. Welcome back to Psychic Today. I'm your host, Jill Roberts, and we're going to continue with the Fool and what he's really trying to show us and teach us. Now, the Fool is about developing poise in the universe. It helps us to renew a sense of innocence. It brings childlike wisdom and response to the world, and it also involves learning to keep this wisdom alive within us while also infusing our physical life with higher consciousness. Each day must be seen as new and approached without fear. At the same time, the fool also represents inexperience, which is why the life power of our spirit must enter into this physical journey through life to gain real life experience. The fourth element is air. It's about the breath of life. And our newly awakened superconsciousness is preparing to expand and to explore an air that is an active element that, <clears throat> excuse me, that likes to move and to expand. Now, each of these keys has a secret name, or what we call an esoteric title, and the full secret name of is the spirit of the ether. The full cor- corresponds with the planet Uranus. Uranus is an oddball planet with its rings that orbit vertically rather than horizontally like the others. And interestingly, it was also discovered by an amateur astronomer instead of a professional. When this planet is active within our chart, we can expect the unexpected. This is the planet of change, genius, unconventional behavior, and revolution in astrology. Uranus co-rules Aquarius, as well as the 11th house, or the house of friendships, within the Zodiac. Zodiac also refers to friendships and relate to our network and how they support us in our adventures in life, as well as in the kind of friend that we are to others. The 11th house also speaks to destiny. In simple terms, it's our hopes and dreams and it's what we desire and we want to achieve in life. Now, other various keywords that are associated with the fool include things like radiance, having courage, transcendence, being willing to take risks, beginning a new adventure of any kind, or being at a crossroads where we have to make a big leap of faith and feeling guided to make that leap of faith. It is also about innocence and trust, and its unmanifested yet unlimited potential, which varied strengths and virtues that the fool helps us to achieve. These include things like self-assurance and awareness, as well as originality. The fool doesn't mind being different. In fact, he's fairly aloof to other people's opinions and judgments, which is something that we could all use a good dose of. When it comes to any of these keys, we ha- all have strengths and weaknesses. They all have vi- we all they all have vices and virtues. Now that we <clears throat> mean the strengths of the virtues is that they're balanced and pure expression of the archetype. But the vices and the weaknesses are more imbalanced or distorted expressions of that archetype. Maybe too much or too little of that archetype qualities. So when it comes to the weaknesses and the vices and the shadow side, what we want to do is recognize where they're at and where they're expressing these vices. And we want to bring them back into a state of balance rather than imbalance or distortion. So for example, with the fool, some of the weaknesses and the vices that come up with the fool include being foolish or being impractical or being completely oblivious. 
having a lack of self-awareness or the impact we have on others. One way that the shadow or the fool might show up is when we refuse to try new things. We remain rigid or psychologically stuck. When it comes to working with tarot, one of the things we want to really take a look at and play, pay attention to is when we are expressing the strengths and the virtues and when we are expressing the weaknesses, the vices that are, sh- are the shadow sides. It's really important for us to acknowledge our own shadow side to tell ourselves the truth about it and to really stare in the eye to take a look at it. Why don't we have to accept those parts of ourselves? We need to know, okay, yeah, I've got this going on within me, but don't want to just stop there. We want to say, well, it's just how I am, right? Well, we also want to work on transforming it. We want to dig into it. Why am I that way? Why am I expressing this kind of shadow aspect or this distortion of the weakness of this archetype? What is it that I need to shift within me and what is the process of going into the shadow? Looking at it really, coming to understand why we're expressing the shadow side. This is a huge part of what we call spiritual alchemy. So when we do this work and we really look at ourselves, we really face it and we really start to question and reevaluate who we are and why we are behaving that way, then we can start the process of clearing it up. You know, reprogramming and shifting what we believe about ourselves and about other people and how things are, how they need to be. And we can then start paying more attention to what are the strengths and the pure balanced expressions of this archetype. That I could be readjusting myself to this is all about the principle of polarity. You know, there's every quality is a spectrum of energy, the balance point in the middle. That is the strength or the virtue. But then again, too much or not enough or too little, those are where we get into the imbalances. But regardless of where we are in the spectrum, we can then shift that energy, right? This is the process we call mental alchemy or spiritual alchemy. And that's when we learn to take that energy from wherever it is right now, shift it, change its vibration, and take it through its transformational processes and bring it to the balance point. This is the work that we really want to dig into, into the alchemy of one of the self. And when we do, that is when we find within the shadow there is gold to be found. There are gifts to be awakened within us. So the shadow side isn't our enemy. It's not like our dark side is actually our teacher. These are the parts within us that the shadow is hidden deep within the subconscious of our being. And that we need to reclaim and to reawaken and bring them out and allow the expression in a way that is controlled so we can be in greater self-mastery. Rather than just erupting from the depths of our subconscious. We want to constantly work with it transform it and transform the shadow into light let's take a look at how the fool shows up in our life here and now think of times when you've been the fool in life now as children we come into this world wide-eyed with wonder and innocence and we're ignorant to the ways of the world and therefore we're ready to learn everything is a new adventure to a child and when we're young there are very few limits upon our imagination We have this desire to laugh and to play to our heart's content. So we all start life as the fool. But even as adults, I'm sure we can all recall times when we felt or acted foolish. Or perhaps there have been times where we feared the future. The lack in the universe to guide us. That would be more of the shadow side. The only way that we can keep ourselves open to limitless possibilities that are available in any moment to us is if we can trust the universe. And this is what the fool is here to teach us. As we begin this work, I recommend doing some journaling on how, when, and in what circumstances you found yourself being the fool. Keep separate sections for when you've expressed the positive qualities, the strengths, of the fool versus falling into the weaknesses or the shadow aspects of the fool. 
the more you come to recognize the fool in your life, the more it will also connect you with one of your parallel lives, where the fool is the dominant archetype. What might our parallel life be like under the archetype of the fool? Well, one example of the full manifestation is as a comedian, but not just any type of comedian. Think of someone like Charlie Chaplin. He was a genius of his trade. His ability to express humor non-verbally through silent films were yet still conveying the energy of the message was unparalleled. He harnessed the full archetype in the best way possible. But the most quintessential example of full manifestation into a life as is as a genius savant. Savant may stand out as unusual, quirky, and maybe even OCD. But then it displayed here genius in some area of music, art, or math. Now, a good example of this is Dustin Hoffman in the 1988 film Rain Man. Most of us are either born that way or acquire these abilities after some accident such as a head injury. But what's fascinating is that psychiatrists are now reporting a phenomenon they call sudden savant syndrome, where ordinary people like you and me are spontaneously awakening to the genius capacities with no specific incident triggering it. A scientist scientists rather are now proposing that such genius abilities may be in need within all of us as a metaphysician i propose that the full archetype was at play in these people's lives by working with the fool and invoking its energies into your life you too can spontaneously awaken your inner genius we can do it by actively actively engaging with the symbols and consciously using them as communication tools. Take notes, record in science, keep track of dreams, notice the forces and energies that set in motion in your life, and notice that you what you learn about yourself through this journey. But really get the most out of this journey, put the tools into application. This is the feeling and experiencing the energies come alive in our own life. So join me again. We're going to go through all of the 22 archetypes and the tarot and how this relates to making a big shift in consciousness.